Hi, I'm Dara Caponegro and I'm the creative director of Schumacher and I'm also the editor-in-chief of Frederick Magazine and welcome to my deep dive with Dara. Today we have the illustrious architect with us, Peter Penoyer, who's a dear friend, someone I've known a very long time and I've watched his career grow and blossom and now he's one of the preeminent architects in the United States. So welcome, Peter. Thank you, Dara. It's thrilling to be here and um, I treasure our friendship, especially any friend who calls me illustrious. <laughs> well, it's really nice to have you here today. We're going to talk about your work and about classicism in particular. Great. So um, when I think of your work, I think of mostly about classical architecture. Right. What is it about classical architecture that resonates with you? So, I mean, I'd say classical architecture is almost like my reality. It's like every building that I've seen that I love kind of builds up in my mind over the years. Um, and the years go by and it becomes a kind of a library of images and ideas. Um, and I think a lot of the architecture we look at is actually classical, whether or not it has the obvious attributes of classicism. It doesn't have to have columns and pilasters, um, but a lot of the best architecture, even work that looks more modern, is, is you know, basically classical in that it's based on a system of proportion and harmony and beauty. So uh, that's what it's all about. It sounds like a kind of vague answer, but it's, it's all there. It's all in my head and it keeps building. Um, so do you have a photographic memory of buildings when, I, you, when uh, you say that you, you know, when they enter your head and you keep building on them? I wish I did. I don't think it's that accurate. Um, and that's why I have, uh, you know, books. And my friend Gregory Gilmartin, he's in my office, collects books and we have his library, which now amounts to thousands of books. Wow. Um, and then I travel and I sketch and I take photographs. And of course, we all are beginning to build up images in Instagram. So all of the above. If I wish I did have that photographic memory where I could just file things away. That would be terrific. But you do have an incredible mm -hmm. grasp of um, architecture um, in, in terms of uh, history, historic architecture. So what are some of the buildings and architects that really you know, speak to you? And are there specific ones? And can you tell us a little bit about why? Right, so I mean, as a New Yorker, I think it's fair to say there are some buildings that are monuments that are wonderful. And then there's some buildings that are almost anonymous that are just part of the cityscape. Uh, so the New York Public Library, uh, for example, is I think the most important classical building in New York. Um, and just such an incredible achievement on so many levels, um, from the plan to the section to the way you move through it, the whole experience of it, down to the smallest detail, the base on the, you know, the, the statues in front, the, the base on the, the flagpoles, the lamps. Um, uh, so that, there's an example of a singular monument that is, you know, extraordinary. Then I might be walking down a street, um, 70th Street off of, Park Avenue, and there are probably five or six or seven wonderful houses on that street. Can I tell you off the top of my head who is the architect of each one? No, I can't, but they all come together. Some of them are sort of ordinary and some of them are more special, but they make a place that is is a wonderful place to be, and it feels human and beautiful and, and intimate, um, and, and that's the kind of anonymous streetscapes that I love about New York and frankly when I travel I also love that so it's not always about looking uh, at the masterpieces although I love doing that too it's about what a place feels like when you put together all the buildings that make the place yeah that's one of the fun things about watching the Gilded Age that I found recently right. it's just right. like you know the architecture and the, the uh, it, may, it gives you a real appreciation for the Upper East Side in particular yes have yes. you watched it I, I've watched it and it's fun for me because I love looking at it, but I also have studied enough about New York architectural history that I actually, you know, know which building preceded the building that they live oh, in. Oh, wow, that's which cool. Was, you know, so I know there was a bizarre Gothic castle right there at the corner uh, uh, of that street at Fifth Avenue that belonged to a woman called the, the Princess del Drago. Um, and and this, this enriches it. So the study of history does enrich your, you know, feeling about looking at architecture and looking at a street. Yeah. Do you think yeah. they got it right in that show? No. No. Okay. The architecture is completely, <laughs> sorry. But like, no, that's, that's yeah, why I'm no, asking. They, well, they could do better. Uh -huh. there are many things are white. Like the costumes, I think, are, and I don't know costumes, so maybe I don't know what I'm talking about, but I think they're absolutely 
splendid, extraordinary, evocative, and fun to look at. And then some of the architecture seems more like, you know, like stage sets than uh -huh. than the real thing. But I think that it's the whole the whole spectacle of it is great. Yeah, it's fun to watch. I mean, I like it mostly from a visual perspective. You've done a multitude of projects. So you just finished a, a apartment building on Madison Avenue, which right. is incredible, and it's called. It's called the Benson. The Benson. Yes. Yeah. So that's extraordinary. And then obviously you do homes for really beautiful homes, um, and you're designing for modern families. So is there ever a push and pull between you know what a modern family might need and you know, the tenets of classical architecture? Well, I, I think that you know the classical architecture suggests to some people something perhaps out of date, something formal, um, and especially the idea that maybe it means that the rooms are quite closed off one to the next. Uh -huh. um, and that's not uh, necessary at all. In fact, we tend to do plans that actually, if you don't look at the architecture, the walls look like open plan. So my own house has no doors between any of the rooms on the first floor other than one um, library, which is really useful during COVID. Um, but the rest of it is actually open plan. Um, that, that's an example of you know a, a way of using classicism that works well for the way we live now. I can be cooking in the kitchen and I can talk to someone who's you know friend or family at the dining room table, and then they in turn can look both at the living room and the kitchen. That's just a basic kind of connection that I don't think would have existed in, you know, a 19th century house. Right, um, right. And in fact, our friends have a 19th century house uh, just a couple of miles away. And there is a similarity in the architectural aesthetic. It's Greek revival, but you go from one room to another through a little door that you can close because it's drafty, right, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. all of that. Right, so there are reasons for some of that architecture. It, yeah, uh, there are reasons, then. and yeah. I mean, if it were a very formal house in the 19th century, you'd want the door into the bedroom to swing so you wouldn't see the bed because you're, if your servant came in, which I don't have that, we don't have that, but you know, the, so there, even things like door swings were different in traditional architecture. Oh, that's so interesting. Um, and even things like light. So, you know, in the house in the Gilded Age, those rooms would have been much darker um, and they would have done something called the Rembrandt lighting, which is when they pulled the curtains so closely that they could arrange it so there was one shaft of light entering your parlor. Okay. And that was considered desirable. Uh -huh. Where in Georgian architecture, they would block up the windows on one side of the bedroom in order to only have light from one side, which is considered desirable. And why, though? That's I, so interesting. Do you have you any know what? Idea? I still haven't gotten to the bottom uh -huh. of that uh, uh -huh. mystery. <laughs> That's so interesting. Okay. so. Why do you think um, classical architecture has some, such staying, staying power? Is, does it make you feel a certain way? Is it, you know, what is it about it? Well, so, I mean, at some level, it makes you feel, uh, well, small and untalented, because when you look at the great architecture of the past, it means you're challenged to try to measure your work against it. And we discover very quickly that none of us are geniuses. And we're trying to do something that's exceptionally challenging and requires great patience and painstaking effort and love, you know, for all of it. So it, it makes you feel, it, it, it is a constant reminder of how we have to work on our skills and our, and, our, and our craft. But the reason I think it stays with us forever is because it keeps building. And everything that we do today is building on all the buildings that we've loved in the past, and in turn, how other architects have interpreted other models. So there's a continuity and a shared uh, kind of you know, language. And if you can do something today that is somehow builds on something in the past, but makes it better or different, that's incredibly rewarding. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of your projects? So um, you brought along um, a few different examples of designing for a modern family. So there's a library, a blue library with red chairs. And um, I'm just wondering, like, maybe you can give us some examples of um, how some of these contemporary houses feel right for the modern family. Right, so that was, um, that's an interesting project because it's a cupola on top of a 19th century uh, commercial building in lower Manhattan. Um, and what to do at the top of that cupola. So it's, it's like a library game room for a family. Um, rather than put a bedroom there, it's a place where you ascend to to do things that are fun. And, um, Sounds and, incredible. Uh, yeah, and we opened a, <laughs> 
we opened up the ceiling and created a dome and were able to capture light from windows that are hidden behind a cornice. It sounds very strange, but there, there's almost a mysterious glowing light. Uh -huh. um, and the room is just about this envelope of the, this wonderful blue color, which uh, my wife, Katie Ritter, chose. She was the interior designer. Um, and a table in the middle that you can get together and a little refrigerator for the wine, uh, which is an important part of it. So yeah. there's almost a ritual suggested by it, which is I'm coming here to be around a table with friends or family um, to think about things together and maybe have a glass of wine, which is different than Rune's Udi, where there's a sectional in the corner and it's not that architectural and it's all about the television or something. Right. So there's a sense of yeah. ritual or something. It, it, I think it does. Uh, make what happens there seem more important and more you know centralized. Mm -hmm. Do you think good architecture and great rooms make people behave differently? Oh well I wish I wish I could control <laughs> people with architecture. Um, no but I mean there are some rooms that make us all feel comfortable right and there are some rooms that make us feel uncomfortable so yes that's uh, that's an important part of it. Um, and um, but I, I'm not sure we can actually get people to behave. Uh -huh, right? uh -huh. um, I just wonder if maybe it makes them be better, you know, the best version of themselves or something. Yes, I mean, I think if you if you design a room that um, is is you know beautiful and calm and harmonious, I think it feels it's like it brings a kind of dignity to what you're doing. You know, if you're having a dining room that is arranged. I think just the arrangement of things in, in their right place is important. Um, you know, you you set the table right, you do all these things. It's it's just part of the same spirit. Yeah, dignity I think is a really um, something to aspire to. Uh, right. It's a nice word. You have a beautiful, um, looks like it's a double height living room and, and a gorgeous yellow. Tell uh, us a little bit about that. That's a project we did with Miles Red and his office, it's always worth mentioning the interior designer because uh, they are uh, a key part of it, as are the landscape architects and all the other folks we work with. Um, so that is a, a long house facing over a, a rolling landscape in Ohio. It's facing a pond. Um, and that room is intended to respond to the scale of the view. So you're looking at this terrific view and it's a lofty room that brings light in um, all the way to the front of the house through sort of a, a balcony-like opening into a hallway for the bedroom. So when I do a double height room, and I love the way Miles, uh, uh, it, you know, decorated it, it should be both something uplifting, exciting, uh, but also it should be used to bring light into other spaces in the house, um, even into the stair. So, um, and that's a room that has some fairly robust classical elements, you know, brackets and a door frame and, and all that. So it, it, in a scale space like that, you can actually do architecture that's quite robust. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, and then tell us about this gorgeous um, staircase, this, this one here. Oh, yes. Yeah. So that's, um, that's a, a, a circular stair uh, with an open light well that brings light from the roof of a townhouse in Greenwich Village all the way to the entrance. And um, it's a tightly wound stair, which allowed us to make the rooms in the front of the back of the house, which is a mid 19th century house, as large as possible. The challenge with those houses is that they aren't very deep. So you have to come up with this, the stair that is both beautiful, but also as compact as it can be. Um, and it becomes a piece of sculpture in the middle of the house. So when clients come to you, they obviously have a huge appreciation for your work. Tell us um, a little bit about what the process is for designing a house from scratch with your client. So I believe in having people show me pictures or talk about buildings that they like. Um, I don't think that that tamps down our creativity at all. I think it's a helpful way of having conversations about design, using visuals rather than just uh, you know, talking about design ideas in the abstract. Um, and they have to be prepared for me to say, I like that, but I think we could do much better than that. So it's not all give me that or give me this. It's not a laundry list. It's more just a way of spurring conversation. And then I think it's really important and we always have a list of every single room someone thinks they want. 
and possibly a size for that room, which isn't ever going to be the size in the design. But we think it's really important to be able to get everything you want into something and then add up what that means in terms of size. Because very often, and this happened to you know, Katie and I, when we did our own house, you do the list and then you realize, well, I didn't want to build a 8,000 square foot house. I only want a 6,000 square foot house. So it helps you discipline your goals before you fall in love with something you've drawn that actually turns out to be too big. Or, uh -huh. You know, so bracketing, in, in a way, ha having the architecture bracketed by your real program and needs and desires is, is, is very important, which is the opposite of the idea of having the genius architect run off and just do some bursts of creativity. Right. Right. It um, sounds like it would really uh, make for a house that the people that, that you're designing for are very comfortable in. Yeah. And we yeah. tell people, like, make your list and don't try to edit it down too far and also put things on it that might be impossible on the face of it to achieve. You know, I want my breakfast room to have east light, but I also want to be able to see the sunset or uh -huh. you know, things that might not be look like they're possible just put all the challenges into that list and then we'll do our best and try okay. to solve for them. That's so interesting. Has the client ever brought to you a, an idea where you're like, Oh my God, we have to discourage this. And usually it's about size. You know, the idea, you know, we've had a couple of times people say, I want my house to be a number of pavilions connect connected by galleries or hallways. And then, you know, that turns out to be a wonderful idea. That's, you know, just so wildly extravagant when you add up sort of the area, uh, but but most people's ideas have a germ of something really wonderful. And do you do you feel like a house can be too you know like what's too big for a house? Is there any rule or just depends on who's living there and how they live in it? I, I, well, I mean, it's clearly uh, less challenging to make a beautiful house that's under six thousand square feet. Um, that's I don't know why that number, but it seems to be if you get to ten thousand, it's more challenging. And every time you add a thousand, it still could be a beautiful house. And I've done houses that are larger than that, but it becomes more challenging. Interesting. Um, and I think these mega houses are, are really tough mm -hmm. um, to, you know, and at some point, if you, especially if you want a house to be like a beautiful object that you see from every angle, if they become too sprawling, it's, it's, you know, you have to then deal with how to unfold the house visually as you approach it so that you don't see all of it. Yeah, and um, that's something that a lot of people don't think of, I'm sure. You know, they probably think, oh, I want the biggest house I can afford, and yeah. right? And no, uh, yeah, so for you're doing reason, them a real service. I, well, I don't know. I mean, I, the, the, my problem is that all my clients seem to be very sensible people. So, <laughs> <laughs> But if, if you can find me anyone who's totally extravagant, well, let me do whatever under the moon. I'd love to meet them. I think you found that person in your check house. Oh, yes. Well, that but that was a specific gift to the city of Cleveland of making something for a museum ultimately. So uh -huh. it's only, you know, that family's for their lifetime, but it's really a creation that he, they never would have done had it not been the idea of giving it away at the end. Right. The right. Okay. Well, tell us, since we're on that subject, tell us a little bit about that project. Um, so the project is called Rowdy Meadow and it's a house um, set in a sculpture park uh, near Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and our client, who's a, a, as a friend, um, decided at some point during the design process that it shouldn't just be influenced by arts and crafts, but it should be expressive of a style called Czech Cubism, which no one has heard of, or right. someone may have heard of it. <laughs> I certainly didn't <laughs> I had, before I, you told me about it. I had encountered it in Prague in 1986 with my friend Gregory. We designed it um, and we had some books on it that were tucked away in the bookshelf like fine wine waiting for the right dinner uh, but I'd sort of forgotten about them um, and it's an obscure style where the walls and the ceiling fuse in a kind of crystalline pattern that expresses the energy don't worry I'm not going to get psychic on you <laughs> um, of the kind of architecture it's almost like gothic architecture without all the articulating moldings and ribs um, and, and that was a really challenging and wonderful project. And it involved collaboration with artists um, and, and it incorporates an art collection and furniture collection that's stupendous. So that was a once in a lifetime yeah. opportunity. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And you have yeah. a book on it. And what's the book yes. called? It's called Rowdy Meadow. Okay. House, Land, Art.
Okay. Because it's the sculpture incredible. park itself is, you know, it has works by, you know, some of the most interesting uh, artists alive, and uh, from Richard Serra to Ai Weiwei to you know, Andy Gullsworthy. So it's terrific. Yeah, that sounds really yeah. amazing. And is it open to the public, or one day it, it will be it, open to the public? One day it will be. There are certain organizations that arrange uh, visits to the sculpture park, but it will be open one day. And how long did you work on that house? It was, this sounds terrible, I think uh, five years with a one year hiatus while we were cogitating how to make it Czech Cubist. Uh -huh. That was a puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating. But really. we went, and that in included trips to. Paris to find furniture, trips to Italy to find stone, trips to Prague to look at cubism. Um, we've talked about how hard it is to design a, um, a house for yourself. So how did you approach designing your own house up in Millbrook? Yes, well, architects aren't supposed to do this, right? It's like <laughs> a danger sign. Um, so I had always been sketching um, a square villa as my ideal dream house based on houses like Sir Johnson's Pitt's Hanger Manor, which is near London, mm -hmm. which has been beautifully restored and is open to the public now, and other houses that I thought were really beautiful that were simple and but classical. Um, and I always had this idea. So um, I began sketching madly and, and eventually gave all my trace to my friend and partner, Gregory Gilmartin, who then shut his door and turned all my you know, crazy ideas into what, what we see now. Um, but we did have a program. We knew how many bedrooms and we knew that we wanted the kids to have bathrooms and all these basic things. Um, and, you know, I love cooking, so I wanted to be able to see the dining room. And it didn't bother me that if we had a dinner party, the people were looking, some of them, into the kitchen. So there were sort of, you know, arrangements of things, which way the rooms faced, the connection to the garden, um, so the garden path, which is at the center of Katie's garden, uh, is directly in line with the hall that runs through the whole house. So you can stand anywhere in the house and look through. So all these little things became challenges to weave them into one design. Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned Katie before, so she's an incredible interior designer. And um, you've worked on lots of projects together. So yes. how did, at what point did she, you know, I mean, did you just start it together from the beginning? I would imagine so. We did, but she gave me real space to do the architecture, and I gave her complete space to do the interior design. You know, and I told her, you know, I was happy to see colors and fabrics, but I didn't want to make it designed by committee. I wanted her to do what she thought was her best work without me trying to edit it. Because I wouldn't be able to see the complete, for instance, living room had she told me you're going to have a pink living room, uh -huh. I wouldn't have been able to understand how that would make sense until, you know, she, well, we have these big, uh, tall curtains that are this, I would call it drab green. That doesn't sound great, does it? But it's against the pink, it's beautiful. And then there are portieres. So the way it all worked together, it turned out to be the best thing to let her do her deal without my interfering. Uh, although she did let me put in a few antiques that maybe were, there, there are statues in the house, uh -huh. which she was very patient about. <laughs> <laughs> Except when I arrived with, I think, the third or fourth Abraham Lincoln bust. She said, one too many. Oh, <laughs> so, so he's in my office now. <laughs> Sounds like a great reflection of your marriage. That's so yeah. nice. It's well, really a, um, a good recipe, I think, for yeah. a happy marriage. I mean, it would be that or it would be bad reality TV. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. So I remember... Um, I only visited once for, um, but the, one of the things that caught my attention was the tile on the floor when you first walk in. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so, so there's an example of something I never would have dreamed, you know, I do in any way that we would have shiny Moroccan glazed tile in our entry hall in a, in a house that looks fairly traditional, um, but it's a beautiful, unexpected, colorful kind of happy note in a house. And it's a tile that we first discovered on a trip. Um, we were in Fez together, you know, 25 years ago. And we found the workshop where they oh, wow. resuscitated this craft, which had almost disappeared in Morocco. Um, and they were making these tiles. And we came back with a, uh, a sample board, the, 
the craftsmen were so excited that we wanted it that I think it was still wet in our suitcase <laughs> um, of these tiles, not knowing that years later we would have a house that would incorporate them. That's so romantic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's really nice. So um, tell us about how you think about a house's uh, relationship to the land. Um, you know, the, the dream for me is finding a place on the land uh, where you can appreciate the house from all four directions. Um, that's not every site is like that. Um, and it's, you know, that's, that's the idea of finding kind of a commanding position that makes it fit on the, you know, on the lot. Um, and then the other layer is, which is really exciting, is if you can also orient it to a, a distant view or some view, and literally think about how you know the important rooms, not every room, frames that view. So you know the first house I designed for uh, the writer, late writer Louis Auchincloss and his wife Adele, was framed from his library uh, directly onto the. Uh, sort of the valley between two distant peaks uh, in the Catskills uh -huh. and that kind of oriented that house so if there's something like that in the land a tree some physical feature um, and the end you can frame it with a view that's that's the magical part for me or I mean it's pretentious to say magical it's understandable that that you you know you're treating the lens almost like a painting mm -hmm. uh, uh, because I think fr frame views are much more powerful um, sometimes than just the view you get if you stand in a field. Uh, right, right. That makes sense. All right, so years ago we judged the Institute of Classical Architecture Awards together. And um, I remember you're talking about modern architecture and it felt to me back then that you weren't a big fan. Is that still the case? Um, I would say that first of all that I'm, you know, I, I, I'm happy for people who want to build you know, the Apple store as their house mm -hmm. or live in a white box um, in a kind of minimalist, you know, environment. Uh, that's fine, but it, I don't find it very resonant. Um, and I prefer architecture that has layers and complexity um, and isn't oversimplified uh, because I think, you know, architecture, uh, decoration, art, just the passage of our time in our lives is never simple. So. I, I don't feel comfortable in super wide stark houses. Mm -hmm. Some people actually love them. Um, and, and also I, I worry about any architecture, and this is, goes for some traditional practices too, where you think you're, you delude yourself into thinking that you are the source of the genius of the design. And, and, and so you look into yourself constantly or to your last work. Um, and I think it's better to challenge yourself by looking at um, other, what other people have tried to achieve. And again, it makes you feel small, right? Uh, so that's another problem I have with some modern design, that it seems to be uh, solipsistic and not looking out at the world and not, ch not, not as challenging, um, it, it, which is kind of the, the, the paradox. Like actually engaging with history and tradition, I think is more challenging mm -hmm. and, and can be much more radical than uh -huh. just making something super simple. Interesting. Yeah. Well, one thing you said to me that day, which I had never thought of, was that modern buildings don't age as well. That is a problem. It's a very interesting uh, subject, especially if you like pre preserving buildings and restoring them, as I do. Because I love, when we have an old brick or stone building, we like to have all the, the imperfections there. Even though we restore and fix everything, we like to show the signs of time. Um, if you restore a glass building, you're actually as happened with the Colgate Palmolive building on Park Avenue. The Land Rights Commission allowed them to replace the entire skin of the building because there is no way of making that look better. Uh -huh. And it doesn't look great with the passage of time. So your passion mm -hmm. for architecture mm -hmm. certainly doesn't seem to have waned since <laughs> no. I met you. Yeah. Um, did you ever think about becoming anything else besides an architect? I really didn't. Isn't that terrible? I was one no, of those annoying, I think that's I was fantastic. An, I was an annoying child who was sitting in my <laughs> my room, you know, trying to teach myself perspective and, um, and you know, briefly interested in the international style, which is much more uh, susceptible to like self-taught perspective. And my father was the chairman of an obscure agency called the Art Commission when I was a kid, uh, which 
uh, has to approve any construction projects on new land in, uh, in public property in Manhattan, schools, bus shelters, uh -huh. all of that. And so he would bring home the uh, handouts, exhibits, uh, and show them to me. So that was, that, that's, that sparked an early interest, I think. So interesting. Yeah. And if you were going to give advice to a budding architect, what advice would you give? I'd say travel and look and sketch. Don't just take pictures, but sketch. Um, and, and, you know, think about how buildings you look at were put together and why they look the way they do. Um, and then, um, you know, I'd also say read and try to understand architecture you're looking at in terms of the architect's intention. Um, you know, and, and I would just say, try to learn about, if, you're, if you think you want to do minimalism, we'll try to find out who the architects were who did that really well and understand the struggles they went through. Um, I think that's, uh, that's what I would do. And I would say, try to solve architectural problems and not start out by trying to solve global problems. Um, you know, because I think we're all really concerned about climate change and all those things. And the good news is that I think the engineers and the people who make the parts that make buildings are really good at this and are bringing us forward. Every year things get better, um, but they shouldn't, students shouldn't try to feel like they have to solve all that initially, because a lot of people we work with every day are bringing expertise that's way beyond, for instance, we use people called envelope consultants, even on houses, to try to refine the insulation better and better and better. And I think it's a little bit arrogant for us architects to think that we're gonna marshal all of those engineering and technical aspects, uh, when we really, really, we should collaborate with people whose life mission is to get that better. Uh huh. Peter, I understand you have a new book coming out. Right, so we're, we have two books in the works. One is about our firm's work, uh, we'll have townhouses and apartment buildings uh, and a lot of unusual projects. Jeff Koons' house, which is, has some interesting art, as you can imagine, um, and is very classical, which surprises some yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and even the smallest commission we've ever uh, had, which is a clock, just a clock for the Moynihan train hall where Amtrak comes through, mm -hmm. uh, but it is 12 feet tall and wow. weighs almost 4,000 pounds. Oh my God. So <laughs> okay. it's, it's a clock, but, um, and I think it will be interesting in a lot of drawings um, and a lot of stories about how these projects uh, came around. I'm also contributing an essay to a new book on the architecture of Rosario Candela, who designed the greatest apartment houses in Manhattan uh, with David Netto and Paul Goldberg. I've, I've uh, looked at many a New York City apartment, you know, when we were looking for apartments, and uh, a few of them were Rosario Candela buildings, and they're beautiful, and his floor plans are so perfect. Yeah, no, he, yeah. he could solve the puzzle. He could make any plan work, and he could put together duplexes and simplexes, and he was an absolute genius at the kind of puzzle solving. In fact, uh, after the Depression, when he had no work, he became a cryptographer. What's for a the, cryptographer? So, uh, okay. Cryptography, uh, code breaking. Oh, like wow. The military. Oh, okay. oh, no, no. And I, okay. and I found a book that okay. he wrote on cryptography. Wow. So, yeah. Wow. So his brain was uh, even bigger than what we thought. Uh -huh. <laughs> Interesting. So, Peter, thank you so much for joining me on this deep dive with Dara. Thank you, Dara. It was Dara. really fascinating. Thank you. I mean, it, it was a pleasure. It's been great. Thank you so much. And stay tuned for the next episode of Deep Dive with Dara.